Okay, this video is uh, about realism, and realism is a core theory in international relations. Like any of the other theories, it claims uh, that it um, has the sole authoritative lens on how we have to interpret international relations. Uh, the starting point, and in particular classic realism, uh, is that aggression is an inherent uh, part of human nature. We can't just eradicate it, we can't escape it, uh, it is built in, it's hardwired in, uh, and this is why states are always at odds with one another. Um, one of the kind of classic realist uh, accounts uh, is Karl von Clausewitz. He was a Prussian general um, in the 19th century. Um, and, and Clausewitz um, coined that famous uh, dictum uh, that war is just a continuation of politics by other means. So on the entire spectrum of politics, and sometimes we say politics or diplomacy, but on the entire spectrum of, of politics or diplomacy, war is just one of the elements. Uh, so it's been a universal norm in human history, it's a political tool, uh, and force uh, can only also be used as a principal tool by non-state actors to challenge the status quo. So again, as much as realism always looks at states, certainly force, the use of force, uh, is also a tool by non-state actors, meaning, of course, uh, groups. Uh, we've discussed the three images of war, that international relations, uh, we look at the individual level, is uh, driven by actions of individuals, driven by the domestic regimes of states, or international uh, anarchy. Uh, and realism doesn't really worry too much about uh, the second level, uh, but classic realism really looks at, you know, at human nature, and then um, structural realism looks at the structure, uh, the international uh, anarchy. So if you're looking at uh, realism, that cartoon, you know, again, uh, says it all, that it's all about, uh, you know, the, the, the caution is you cannot trust anyone, even uh, your best friend, even uh, that one uh, will eventually stab you in the back, in that case, uh, with a snowball. Um, so realists claim that, you know, it's a central element in international relations as a discipline, but also as, a, as practitioners, that, you know, looking at uh, U.S. attitudes, uh, U.S. practitioners, those engaged in foreign policy making and security making, those at the State Department, DOD, CIA, uh, and the White House, uh, that, you know, the argument is that it has traditionally been uh, the U.S. Um, attitude uh, towards the world, as claimed by realist scholars, of course. Now, what are the central concepts of realism? The first one, the overriding instrument of power is military force. The other elements of power are important, but military force is the most important one. Power itself is political means of conflict resolution in international relations. Uh, this is how you get things done. Uh, the threat or the use of force uh, is the most important political means in international relations. It's in fact, power is the only tool to resolve uh, differences now, in a condition of scarcity in international relations, looking at resources as one one, one example, uh, that always will lead uh, to conflict between actors. States have vital interest in international relations and they're the only entities entitled to have them. Uh, so it's a very state-centric uh, approach to international relations. It does not look at issues like human security. It does not look at uh, non-state actors and what their sort of what their threat or their uh, demands uh, are might be. It doesn't also look at international relations and what their uh, involvement is in global governance. States are the primary actors in international relations. These are the core concepts uh, of uh, realism. Now we have different uh, forms of realism. You know, structural realism does exactly what it says on the tin. It looks at the structure. It looks at international uh, anarchy. Uh, less so than uh, at human nature, it looks at the structure. So again, um, because of the anarchical concept, uh, states are always uh, forced to rely on themselves. So we have the necessity of uh, self-help, uh, the importance of preventing adversaries from acquiring military advantages, and always concern about relative gains. Uh, what will states, other states, uh, what do they gain if you enter an agreement? Uh, if you don't do anything about that particular issue, what will their relative gains be? Um, again, Cultural, cultural and regime type differences is not important. You know, it doesn't matter what sort of regimes, whether these democracies, or authoritarian states, what matters are the structures. Now again, states uh, have two options in terms of balancing. So again, you force, you're faced with a threat and you balance against that threat. 
real estate that we can either uh, engage in uh, external balancing, meaning you form an alliance, or international balancing, you build up arms, you increase your own power assets in order to balance against that particular uh, state. Now, uh, alliance, the, 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 the advantage is that uh, it um, reduces resources, it's cheaper by engaging alliance, but also it brings risks too that uh, can you fully trust that particular ally? Will they actually come to your rescue? Will they be committed to the defense treaty or that alliance you engaged with them? Um, uh, this other uh, option is to bandwagon. Now, to bandwagon meaning uh, states will join forces with a rising state, uh, a more powerful state, um, you know, that is winning the war, it's gaining power, rather than face of uh, balance against uh, that state. Uh, for example, Romania, uh, Bulgaria were not interested in, in, in Nazi uh, ideology, uh, but as the Third Reich was gaining uh, power in, in Europe, uh, those two states bandwagoned with Nazi Germany, even though they you know, didn't agree with it, but felt like they could not face down that threat. Uh, they were not willing uh, to um, commit themselves to the resources needed uh, to uh, bandwagon, uh, to balance against the Nazis. Offensive realism. So again, offensive realism um, is looking at, again, the face of uncertainty. States always assume the worst about each other's intentions. So sometimes uh, states may back path instead of balance. So looking at Britain and, uh, and uh, the United States at the beginning of World War II, when they didn't think that it really was affecting that, in fact, in their own security, they were um, back passing. But offensive realism says that uh, states uh, uh, always the best path to peace is to accumulate uh, more power than anyone else. That is the best insurance policy you have. You can never trust anyone, so you always uh, need to engage in what is called power maximization. Um, aggressors will always seek to challenge, exploit a balancing coalition, so it's always uh, the best insurance policy is uh, uh, um, build up uh, your own uh, power resources. That's the best way to ensure uh, your survival. Um, now again, the most secure and st stable, you know, structure according to that premise would be, uh, you know, to have one global hegemon. Uh, and that's why we have perpetual power competition between the great powers, because everybody wants to, man wants to be an hegemon. Everybody wants to be the most powerful country uh, in the world, which can govern, de facto govern uh, and boss around uh, all the other states. Uh, sometimes conquest may pay it. So again, uh, as it says, offensive realism, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, wars of aggression uh, may be um, expedient, but not always. So again, it's not an, a theory which advocates for offensive wars all the time. Now, defensive war, uh, defensive realism uh, looks, um, again, is a structural theory, looks at uh, anarchy, that we have this continuous risk competition but sometimes cooperation can be a state's best strategy. Um, and it looks like, it, it's defensive realism looks at the structures that whenever there's a troublemaker, the other countries will try to you know, rally and balance against that troublemaker, will punish them. So this is what happened, for example, in, in France uh, under Napoleon, Imperial Germany, First World War, Nazi Germany uh, in the... Um, in the 30s, and of course Saddam Hussein, uh, Iran-Iraq war, and then invasion of Kuwait in 1990. So again, when they're troublemakers, uh, other states will usually rally against that state uh, and balance against it uh, or punish them in, uh, in other forms uh, of, of violence. Uh, and that comes back to that, you know, um, states like the status quo, we've discussed this before, states, countries don't like, in particular the great powers, they don't like surprises, they like the way things uh, the way things are. They like the status quo. So here, a corporation under some conditions increases a state's prospects for avoiding military disadvantages and enable it to signal its benign motives, thereby increasing its security, thereby engaging uh, in uh, alliance. Uh, looking at Otto von Bismarck, uh, you know, Prussian statesman, uh, they put a, he put a break on German expansion after victories against uh, Austria. Um, <coughs> in 1866 and then 1871. So he was a defensive realist. Basically, he knew where to stop with the conquest. 
Um, so another variation of the security dilemma, uh, um, looking at when we can cooperate, when is it feasible to cooperate, when is it feasible to balance, uh, is the balance uh, uh, of threats uh, theory. And that uh, premise says that states don't really balance against power, states really balance against threats. Just look at Canada and the United States, two very, very powerful countries. If there was a balance of power type mentality amongst uh, you know, practitioners, why are they not in a constant state uh, of war? Uh, because neither the Canadians fear the Americans, nor do the Americans fear the Canadians. So here, uh, the notion is that it's a variation of balance of power theory. It is called balance of threats uh, theory. Now, again, according to um, a realism, sovereignty is the key. You know, to protect sovereignty uh, is uh, um, the most important uh, aspect uh, of foreign policy uh, decision making. Uh, many point out that you know U.S. reluctance to international regimes uh, is one of those you know uh, um, reasons why a realist say, well, this is uh, how states think. So again, the American would be reluctant to subject themselves to two many international regimes, international law, even the United Nations, which the United States created, they gave themselves an escape, uh, you know, hatch with the permanent five in the UN Security Council. <clears throat> now, power is an important uh, element of realism. As I mentioned earlier, it's the vital means in international relations. And power is both. It's a currency and it's a relationship. So if state A exercises power, uh, and state B attempts to resist application uh, of that power, that is a relationship. Um, so if state A makes state B to do whatever state A wants states, uh, state B to do, that would mean that state A has more power over state B. So again, state B does something which it wouldn't have done otherwise, but because it's forced to, that would mean that state A uh, has more power over state uh, B. Um, so again, uh, looking at the, the security uh, a dilemma and the balance of power, uh, fearful of one another, the best way to survive is for states to be more powerful. This causes even more powerful states to shift the balance of power in their favor in order to prevent any revisionist state to gain it at their expense. And then even status quo states may end up behaving like revisionist states, and that's the essence of the security dilemma. That's the tragedy of great power politics. The continuous security dilemma, you acquire more power uh, in an effort to balance against another state. Um, instruments of power, diplomatic, military, economic, informational. Uh, so, you know, th this is a very uh, st a straight uh, forward. Uh, again, the military uh, assets of power. So you, these are the instruments, these are the ones you need in order to uh, exert power in, in a relationship. Informational, really, that we're looking at intelligence, but, but we're also looking at, uh, you know, sort of a, a means to uh, dominate the narrative of how you can frame uh, certain uh, certain issues and how dominant you are in framing that particular uh, uh, issue. So these are the uh, uh, instruments of power. Another one for informational, you could call it soft power, that you, uh, you know, defining the agenda. Other people, other states want to be like you because you dominate uh, the agenda or you created the uh, agenda. So they want to emulate your ideals, uh, your, your structures, uh, your political system. Uh, of course, only the combination of capability and will that makes power effective in international relations. You can have all the power assets in the world. If you don't use them, if you don't know how to employ them, they're not that uh, useful in the end. Now, again, realists don't agree on everything. As you could see, there are different strands in, theory, uh, in realist uh, theory. Uh, one particular debate uh, is uh, between realists is between bipolarity and multipolarity. So looking at bipolarity, we had two great superpowers uh, during the Cold War, of course. Uh, and the claim here is that bipolarity is a lot less war-prone than multipolarity. So in a multipolar system, there's more opportunities for great powers to fight. There's greater uh, equality in bipolarity, so distribution of wealth and population uh, is more uneven in multipolar systems. That's where it gives it uh, incentives for the stronger to take advantages uh, of the weaker. There's greater potential for miscalculation in multipolar uh, systems, and there's more clarity about threats uh, in a, bipolarity, uh, a bipolar uh, system. And also balancing is a more efficient uh, in bipolar system. There's no back passing, no other choice.
but to confront uh, directly. So again, this is a debate between what is a more stable two powers, two great powers fa facing each other, or multiple uh, powers facing uh, each other. While, of course, more or less we have a unipolar moment, so again, uh, the US is the sole uh, global uh, hegemon, seen largely as a global hegemon, and certainly still has peer competitors, mo most notably uh, China. Um, there is no security competition anymore, there's no war between uh, the great uh, powers. Um, uh, the caveat here, if the US pulls forces out of one region, a competition or war may break out as the sole pole will no longer be present to maintain order. So again, the US uh, has you know a lot of forces. We're looking at Korea, uh, we're looking at you know, um, and Europe, uh, looking at Japan, uh, looking at you know Middle East. Uh, so the US has extensive forces uh, um, uh, worldwide, which uh, is part of that you know um, American peace and part of that unipolar. Um, uh, moment. Uh, the claim is that socio-political engineering at gunpoint will not create peace. So again, realists are very, very careful and very reluctant to shed too much blood and treasure uh, in creating different different countries. So again, realists spoke out against uh, the Iraq uh, invasion in, in 2003. They spoke out against you know uh, too much meddling in Syria. They don't like socio-political engineering. Uh, they also uh, did not like the idea of building uh, democracy in Afghanistan. So again, this is something that realists uh, would uh, sh uh, shy away from. So if you're looking at uh, uh, the rise of China, looking at offense how offensive realists see it, how defensive realists see what what what's happening as China becomes more powerful, not only economically but also politically. Uh, one is. Offensive realists say, well, clearly they will follow the example of the U.S., uh, will establish themselves as a, a you know, very, very powerful regional hegemon, where they will dominate uh, the region of Asia. They will not tolerate peer competitors. Uh, they will want to increase power gap between itself, Russia and Japan, the closest powerful countries. And they will push the U.S. out of Asia. So the U.S. has, you know, allies and partners uh, uh, in uh, Asia. So China will have a sort of a... Uh, Monroe Doctrine for, for China saying that uh, we don't uh, tolerate any outside parties in Asia. Uh, this is uh, our, our region. We are dominating that region. Defensive realists have a different perspective. Um, they will look for opportunities to shift the balance of power in its favor, but they will not necessarily uh, try to seek regional hegemony. Why not? Because uh, it will not make strategic uh, sense because of balancing coalition that of its rivals, so you know, Japan, Russia, and of course the US, that might crush China. It will cause a lot more headache for China, that it will actually have benefits to China. And then looking at uh, nuclear weapons uh, states, Russia, India, uh, perhaps Japan even want to want a nuclear weapon, they're not easily pushed around. Uh, so these are, you know, these are powerful countries. Uh, they will uh, do anything they can uh, to balance against that and try to contain uh, these sort of Chinese uh, ambitions. And also, last, la lastly, it will be very counterproductive uh, economically. And this is the the last thought I'll give you uh, for um, what it really is the essence of uh, realism. Uh, you all know George uh, Orwell, uh, American uh, British author. Uh, he was an official in the British Empire stationed in India uh, and he wrote this story about shooting an elephant. It was one day he was in his, uh, he was in his house and all of a sudden villages uh, of that uh, particular village he was stationed uh, came uh, and said there was an elephant on the loose uh, in the village. Uh, he grabbed his rifle, uh, he ran out uh, and saw the elephant. It was a beautiful, a beautiful animal which really at that point did not pose any threat to anyone in the village. Not you know, certainly not to British interests. But he turned around and he saw hundreds of hundreds of villagers looking at him, expecting him to kill the elephant. And so he did. He shot and killed uh, the elephant because uh, what it had, would have meant for credibility of the British Empire. It would have ultimately uh, hurt the credibility of him being the British official and the bigger picture of the British Empire, which at the time uh, was ruling over its colony, uh, India. And that is exactly what realists uh, look at. Credibility is a very, very important uh, aspect. So again, much like in high school, states care about their own image. Image is everything. 
looking at uh, Obama and intervention in Syria, Obama drew uh, a red line in the sand and said, uh, well, if the Syrian regime will use chemical weapons, we will react. We will do something about it. And guess what? Syrian regime used chemical weapons. Uh, and Obama was then in that uh, difficult position uh, to, you know, stay true to his word and his threat uh, uh, or, in fact, uh, do nothing. Now, again, this day was saved. Uh, the Russians then negotiated uh, for the Syrian regime to hand over uh, the chemical stockpile and then it was uh, destroyed by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Uh, but many realists uh, scorned Obama for that. You can't draw, as the president or any president, but particularly the U.S. president, you can't draw a red line in the sand and said, that's the tripwire. If you step over that, that means trouble. And then somebody trips over that and you don't do anything about it. So this gave you an overview of what uh, realism is all about, what the core concepts are, and sort of what the different strands uh, within uh, realism uh, are. I hope that was helpful.